Well, good evening, everybody. How's it going? Hope you're having a great Friday evening. Looking forward to a nice weekend. Hope it's not too cold where you are. It's a bit on the chilly side here, only minus two degrees, but uh, not as bad as some places in the world this evening. Who have we got in the chat this evening? Pilsnerish, good to see you again. Number one in the chat, like it. Totorico, hey, hope you're having a super day. Amy, hello, hello, hello. Awesome. And uh, Lumatium, good evening to you too. Yearning9, thanks for joining us again. Much appreciated. And hey, Pom, hope you're having a good day as well. Uh, Geek Brindley, good to see you. BIPOC92, awesome. Good to see you as well. And Captain Kitten, thanks for joining us. Great. Well, this is uh, obviously the IXEG 737-300. I was looking back at my YouTube history. It's been four and a half years since I last did any video content with this aircraft. And I feel like it's a sort of aircraft that time has maybe uh, moved on from, shall we say, that it's, um, it doesn't offer some things that modern uh, add-ons have, like the animated passenger doors. And I know the VNAV is a little bit on the, the clunky side sometimes, but this was my introduction to X-Plane and I, I really love this aircraft. The 737, the classic 737 was uh, almost my introduction to commercial flying. Um, I started flying the A320, but to fly the A320, we had to do a, what's called a jet orientation course. And part of that involved spending about 50 hours in a 737 classic simulator. So from going flying a multi-engine piston aircraft to getting an FO motion simulator for a 737 uh, was fairly awesome. And the thing about the 737 is coming from a Seneca, it was maybe about 40 or 50 knots faster around the traffic pattern and had better automation. But otherwise, it was just a big mechanical twin. You get in the um, 737 after about maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, uh, you can work it. You know how to, to make it work, mostly. Um, within the Airbus, uh, in the Airbus sim, it takes you about four hours just to learn how to turn the thing on. So I quite like it. You know, people can be quite disrespectful of the old 737. It is a bit of a tractor. It's very mechanical, but there's a certain appeal to it as well. And for me, the, the classic, the 737, 300 and 400 um, and 500 uh, are very much of that crossover period. So you've got the EFIS displays, but you've still got mechanical instruments. And, and really that's what I find quite interesting about it. Uh, who in the chat's got the IXEG model? Who flies it um, in the sim? So what we're going to do is fly from uh, Birmingham Airport here. We're going to fly down to Geneva Airport. Flight time will be about 1 hour 20 minutes. So maybe about 2 hours total for the stream. We're on VATSIM at the moment, but it's fairly quiet. We've got a Gatwick controller, a London uh, Heathrow controller, but nobody else in the area. So probably we'll make it up as we go along. Um, one of the, you fly, yeah, awesome, it's good fun, it really is, I, I find it very immersive, even after all this time, I find it very immersive, the head shake effects and the sound effects um, just make it really, really pretty um, immersive for me. The pop-out menus are fairly simple compared to uh, something like the um, the 737NG um, Oh, I forgot the chap's name. That's terrible. Zebo, the 737 by Zebo. The um, pop-outs are very simple, but I quite like that about it. I've got the fuel set, I've got my zero fuel weight set, and I've got ground power on. That's all I need to worry about. So we can basically start setting that up. It would be nice if we had um, animated doors on the aircraft. Um, it would be nice if the uh, FMC had a few more features. But yeah, uh, Captain Kitten nails it exactly. It's got a lot of character this thing, um, and you don't find that in, in a lot of other aircraft. For the time I, after I got this aircraft, um, I was looking for other X-Plane aircraft that had that same feel, and it's difficult to find them, really. So we've got the fuel on board, we've got the passenger load on board, let's just set it up. Um, it is cold and dark at the moment, so just a quick check through to make sure everything is switched to the off position. The fuel pumps are off, um, the battery is off, generators, they uh, trip off automatically, in the center panel here, off, off, uh, electrics, electric pumps are switched off. If you swap between the 737-300 and the 737-200, be really careful here because um, the 300 has got system A, split engine and elect, and B, engine and elect. 
whereas the 200 is um, different. It's got, I think, the engines on A and the LX on B, so you can get that confused. Um, there's nothing really else of uh, interest on the overhead we need to worry about. Looking down here, I'm just going to make sure the transponder's off and the radar switched off, and then we can just fire it up. So one of the quirks on the 737 is it won't take ground power until you've got the battery on. So put the battery in. You could check the standby power by flicking the cap and switching it on. Listen to it spin up. But really what we're interested in is the ground power. So I'm finding some of the manipulators are maybe in need of a little bit of an update as well. But the external power is in. We'll put the emergency exit lights uh, armed. We'll also fasten seat belts and we'll put the window heaters on. There's probably nothing else. Oh yeah, the yaw damper. Let's do it logically. So working up here, fuel pumps, yaw damper. Nothing up there. The next column, electrics, ground power we've done. Electrics looks reasonable. Let's put the IRs on to align. And I'll put that to the status page. We can see how many minutes it takes. The stall warnings. Listen to the sound of the stall warnings. It's pretty good. On the center uh, here, external light, emergency light, sorry, we've done on the right hand column, electric hydraulics we'll deal with later. We've done the window heat. Uh, we've got Mac overspeed warnings as well. Just, um, I, it, I just find it really immersive. Um, on this panel here, I'll set it so I don't forget later. I'm going to go to uh, flight level 350 and at Birmingham, we're at 300 feet. It's been a long time since I've been in the 737, so let's see if I can remember how we do this. Do we set the standby? I think we do. 35,000 feet, so standby pressurization would be 7.2. Could be wrong. You never know. Yeah, um, yeah, the, um, it, it, exactly, uh, Captain Kitten, the SR-22 and the TBM, it's just got that, uh, it's got the character. This is a, this is a, a relaxing old lady to fly, exactly right. Um, bleeds, we can set one of the packs on whenever we have bleed supply. Otherwise, that's us done for the overhead. Hey Jono, good to, good to see you. Hope you're having a super evening. Toto, yeah, you know, it sounds a little bit like a, it's like a GPMG, yeah? And this one here. Yeah. Awesome. Um, on the center panel, there's nothing really of interest to do apart from, we'll set those down to minus 20. We're not going to do any, um, auto lands today. I'll put the audio selector panel on. I'll make sure the transponder is set to 2000 and standby. And then we can start loading up the flight plan. You fly this in real, Marco. Um, you set the destination airfoot elevation in the cabin. Um, in the cabin altitude window, the destination airfoot elevation minus 200. That makes sense. Yes, I remember this now because when you do an immediate return, it remembers its um, departure elevation, doesn't it? And if you descend, you get an off schedule descent warning. Uh, that's one of it's this one here, isn't it? So if I was to return, it would remember where it's going to, and that tells it's gone back to 300. Perfect. So Geneva minus 200, it's about 1400 feet. Let's set it to 1200. Excellent. I hope you enjoy flying the, the 737, uh, Marco. I think it's I think it's a nice aircraft. Off schedule descent resets it, yeah, perfect. You're gonna keep me straight to narrow here, Marco, make sure that we get it all sorted out. Right, so for the flight plan, um we have got simulated on this aircraft, and I don't know how realistic it is. If I go into the init page, go into the second page, we've got GPS left and right. Now, speaking to some older 737 pilots. When you've got GPS fitted, the GPS can drive the EGPWS map, but it doesn't necessarily always feed into the FMGC, uh, FMC position. But I'm sure in this case, um, it's acceptable for the sim. We'll put Birmingham in. I'll go into the next page. Uh, I'll go into the init page, sorry. Go into route. EGBB is the departure. And we're going to go to uh, Geneva, LSGG. Our runway, um, if we can, I'll use runway 33. If that sim comes online, they may want us to use runway uh, 15. But 33 is a more interesting departure. And we're going to be a Jersey 43 Charlie. Just a made up call sign, really. Jersey 43 Charlie. So on the route, 
we are going to route via uh, Daventry. So I'm going to put DTY in here. We'll load the uh, departure in a second. From Daventry, it is going to be the upper mic 605. That goes in here. From the upper mic 605, uh, we are going to Woodley. Now I can't remember if the 737 will autofill if you put down just the um, the airways, but uh, we'll do it this way. I'll probably my 612. That takes us to a uh, Resme near France. And from Resme, it's the uh, upper mic 975. And that should take us to Lussar. So that's basically the route start to finish. We've just got the uh, departures and the arrivals to load. Does it have keyboard entry? I honestly don't know the Matium. I've, I've never checked that. It's not something I, I tend to, to look at, really. Um, I don't really know. Does MD have the, the 737? Let's have a look. I don't think so. I think it's maybe a bit too early for that. So this, this originated in... It was designed initially for X-Plane 11, but it was released for X-Plane 10. Um, so that's the on route part of it. For the departure, we are going to fly off runway uh, 33, I said. And we're going to fly the Daventry 4 Foxtrot departure. While I've got that in my mind, I'm going to set 6,000 feet. We'll have a look at the charts in just a second to verify that. But I'm sure it's 6,000. And for the arrival, uh, do I need to execute it? I can't remember. You don't have to execute it straight away because I think that puts it into processing mode and it slows the real thing down. But let's not worry about that just now. And Geneva, my preference is runway 22 if we can do that. Um, again, if that's in command line, we may have to use the other runway. So a runway uh, 22 Lusar to Romeo execute. And then if I come onto the legs page, we can do two things at once here. I'll flick my uh, attitude, uh, my horizontal situation indicator into plan mode. And I love the fact that this pops up here. So we've got like heads down control on the, the 737. It's not like the Airbus where it's up here. So if you're making a selection on your mouse, the fact it pops up lets you see what you're doing. I also still got a few minutes to go, so we might not be able to step through everything. But let's bring the charts up. And we are going to look at uh, Birmingham. So that's Echo Golf Bravo Bravo. We need to find the airfield chart. So 10-9 on the Japs here. We should be on stand 11. And I've loaded runway uh, 33 for departure. So while I've got the chart up, let me just set the runway heading. So it's 326. Make sure that's set. Coming back down here, let's load the departure chart as well. Departure is the, uh, what did I say, Daventry 4 Fox. It does work really well on the 737, uh, Marco. That, that's good to hear. It, it's a bit on the slow side for the Airbus. The Airbus can get a bit more drag out, so you can be slightly hotter. But uh, on the on the IXEG, certainly, that 5,000 feet, 20 miles works quite nicely. So here's the Daventry departure. We're going to fly ahead to distance 2 from the India Bravo mic on 110.1. Now, one of the minor oddities I noticed with this aircraft and it didn't use to do this, is if I put 110.1 on here as it is just now, it, or it was just now, it'll give me a glide slope warning on the climb out. Uh, it didn't use to do that, and I don't know if it's supposed to do that, but I'll, I'll tune that off at the moment. We are going to fly out, uh, so it's 328 Bravo. So again, one of my hot topics at the moment, 328 Bravo, Alpha, Bravo, B is two miles, and it's two miles on the 328. So that's fine. And then turning right onto the uh, 189 Zulu, that's uh, Zulu 26. There we go, 26. Perfect. Going up to 5,000 feet and then up to 6,000 feet. Okay. Now, one of the quirks on the 737, and I believe this is real because every 737 pilot I've flown with on the Airbus has insisted on removing all of the constraints on the departure, is that if you're going to use VNAV to control the acceleration, it will not let you get above 6,000 feet um, until you take it out of VNAV or you clear those restrictions. The Airbus you can use open climb and it'll, it'll do it for you, but with the 737 VNAV will hold you to these restrictions. 
So you see 737 pilots, or my experience of 737 pilots, is they rip all those constraints out once they've checked them. Well, that's going to take us down to Daventry. So at Radio Aids on here, we could put Trent uh, 115.7. That sounds like a good one to use. 115.7. And it is uh, radial 189, so that's 009. And what I always recommend uh, when you're trying to do VOR stuff, um, if you're not familiar with it, is either don't use the right-hand side at all, or for the most part, try and keep the right-hand side, the FO side, doing the same thing as the captain's side, because it just gets confusing otherwise. There are good reasons to have different things. It doesn't have, um, do we have alt intervene? No, we don't have speed intervene, and we don't have um, alt intervene, Marco. That's, um, speed intervene would allow it to do the uh, RNAV approaches, and I'll intervene. I don't think it's got it. It's been a while. No, I can't see it. But basically, the route we've got on the, the system, see we've got the system aligned now, we can step through it, we can check. If I just zoom in a little bit here. Oh, can everybody see the FMGC, or the FMS, sorry, the nav display and the maps? So ahead, right, right, down, then my Selva, Bensu. That looks like a good route to Switzerland there. And we've got the discontinuity at the end that we'll fix in, uh, well, when we get airborne. I think you can update the autopilot on the classics, can't you, Marco? I think you can make them a bit more RNAV capable. This one, um, you can't get it below 150 knots without um, taking it out of VNAV mode, so it's quite limited in that respect. It's all manual. So what we've got is a valid route. We've got um, IRs that are aligned. So let's fire up the APU, and then we'll do some performance entry. So we've got fuel in the left tank and the right tank, but nothing in the center. We're using 6.4 tons. So we'll put on the um, left side aft pump, and then we'll fire up the APU. Obviously, I didn't do any of the firebell checks, but so be it. It'll be fine. Need to hold that. There we go. Here she comes. You see the displays start to dim as the APU fires up. It puts extra drain on the system. I think it's really... It is very clever. What's happening when the IRs are aligning? Uh, why Pock? Totorico is your man for that, but basically it is sensing the local gravity. It's aligning the inertial reference platform to true north um, using a sense of local gravity and gyro precession. Um, and it uses Kalman filters, as Amy points out, um, to do lots of clever stuff. But it is allowing the inertial system to find local true level and local true north and then it senses acceleration along all three axes of the aircraft. Right, so the APU is up and running. We'll put the APU gen on. We'll do one of them, and then we'll do the other. There's no auto switch logic on this. So the APU is running. We can take the ground part out now. Uh, I'll use the ground services here. Take away the ground power. And having done that, we'll put the APU bleed on uh, the yaw damper's on. I should really put the galley on as well so we can get a cup of tea. And the aircraft should uh, start to provide some air for the passengers down the back. Do you know what I didn't do? I didn't do the position light, the logo light. Those are the most important things, aren't they? Right. Now that we've done the route and we've got the APU ready for pushback, uh, let's have a look at the performance. So there's no load sheet on this aircraft. There's simply my zero fuel weight on here the CG and the trim position. So again, down on the computer here. If I call it the FMGC, I do apologize. I've been calling it that for years. Um, it, it's ju it just slips out. Similarly, thrust and throttles get easily confused. If we push the infrared button now, it will take us to the Perfinet because it knows everything else is good to go. We're going to put our cruise altitude in, a flight level 350. Our zero fuel weight is 40 tons. My reserve fuel, it's probably not too different from a 320, 319, so let's say 2.2 tonnes for the reserves. The calculated gross weight from the aircraft is 64.4, and the load sheet says 64.5, so that's probably, you know, 
close enough. There's just a little bit extra on the gas there. Trans at 18,000, that's an American thing. We'll put 6,000 in for the UK. Um, we are going to use cost index 20, that's fine. And on the takeoff limit, um, we've got the option to derate it here. If I put in a flex temperature of um, 50 degrees, that's going to give me takeoff rating there and climb to rating there. So that seems quite reasonable. On the takeoff page here as well, we can set the, the speeds. Uh, sorry, let me just go back because I think I may have missed the CG in here. No, that's fine. Cruise CG is there. N1 limits, done, take off. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, can I put the CG in there? That's better. Okay, so we'll put the QRH uh, speeds in here of 122, 124, and 134. Having done that, 134 is the V2. We'll put that up here. 134. And we'll also put some speeds across on the bugs here. So V1 and rotate 22 and 24. I'm going to get rid of the ones that I don't need. 22 and 24, around about there. We've got the internal bug set at um, 134. V2 plus 15, that's going to be 149. I'll put another bug there. And our top bug, 210. 737's got a fixed speed schedule. It will show you the speeds on the tape. But simply put, our flap 5 departure, we retract to flap 1 at V2 plus 15, and we bring the flaps up at uh, 190 knots and accelerate up to 210. It's fairly straightforward. If you're doing a flap 15 departure, uh, you've got 170 to consider as well. Hope that makes sense. Uh, what else have we got to do on here? There's another page that I'm missing. This takeoff 2, which is a thrust reduction. And this is where the 737 and the Airbus are quite back to front. You see the Airbus will accelerate for you, but you have to do the thrust reduction yourself. Whereas the 737 will do the thrust reduction itself, but you have to tell it to accelerate. Are you getting all your information about the uh, inertial navigation stuff, uh, YPOC? Toto is um, is an expert on this sort of stuff. You, if you've not seen the work he's done on the uh, Challenger that's uh, coming up, the Hot Start Challenger, it's well worth having a look at. Awesome. Yeah, I remember when the uh, blue and yellow 738 used to be 737-200s, uh, and that was fun. Right, we've done the flight plan, we've done the performance, so I'm going to revert to Airbus Logic and we'll put the performance page on this side and we'll put the legs page on this side. Um, have we done everything we need to do to start the aircraft? We've got the hydraulic pumps and the pitot heat to do when we get start clearance. We've got course set there, we've got V2 set there. The flight directors will target V2 to V2 plus 10 or V2 plus uh, 15, that's fine. Heading set for the departure, altitude set for the departure. So having checked all the fields on here, I'll put the flight directors on 1 and 2. So number 1 is the master, number 2 is the slave flight director. Oh, I should probably put the acceleration altitude on here as well, just for, just for remembering. It's 1,500 feet above the field. Excellent. I think we are basically ready to go. We get our air traffic clearance and confirm it. Just double check, there's no controllers online, so we're going to use uh, the VATSIM 122.8 and I'm going to just leave it squawk 2000. So... Friday 559, descending 352210 to transition level 5500 from Manchester. I'm going to turn them off again. Right, so we get clearance from the tower to start. We need to put the fuel pumps on. We need to put the electric pumps on. Clearance from the ground crew to pressurize the flight controls. So now the flight controls are pressurized. Moving the controls will move the surfaces. Uh, we need to put the uh, bleed uh, packs off to start, but we'll do that when we actually get going. So let's get better push back in to do the push for us. Ground to cockpit. Please show me where you want to go. That'll do. Ground to cockpit. Toe is driving up. Uh, Marco, the other thing I can't remember is on the Airbus, we don't set the auto brake until we've checked the, the brakes and the flight controls on the taxi out, just in case you knock it off. But on the 737, I don't think that's an issue. Can you set the, can you set the, 
uh, auto break while you're on the stand. Set it RTO. Okay, perfect. So we'll do that before we go. It used to have an issue, the IXEG, where it would fail. Right, now the tug's turning up, we'll put the anti-collision lights on. We'll put the transponder to uh, auto. So just the transponder, not the TCAS at the moment. And uh, we'd obviously have checked that our doors are closed, but not a feature in the IXE just now. Oh, do you know what I haven't done? I haven't set my display back to map. That was me talking all the time. Excellent. Above 90 okay. minutes. Good to know. All doors and hatches are closed. Ready to connect. Okay. I should probably make a call on that somehow. Let me put this frequency on here. Birmingham traffic, good evening, Jersey 43, Charlie on stand 11. We're pushing back to the part off runway 33, uh, Birmingham traffic. Right. Nobody around, nobody around. There we go. Proper tug, the, is it Goldhofer? Yeah. I just love the look of the 737. It's got that classic Boeing nose, that um, 707 nose. Turn connected and bypass pin inserted. Release parking brake. All right, parking brake is released and I'm gonna start my timer. Parking pushback and you may start engines. Excellent, we'll start number two engine first. I don't think it really matters on the 737. But start the engines, I'm gonna turn the pack off, I think, because it doesn't do it by itself. And double check everything else. We are going to put the ignition. I'm flying it, so we use the left hand ignition and number two to ground. We make sure that the start valve opens. We're looking for N2 rotation. I think it's 22%. Let's say 22% and we'll look for oil pressure as well. So the core is turning, the fan's starting to turn. There's 20%. Oil pressure's moving. Number two comes on. Up she comes. So there's no need to rush this. We could start the other one once the, the first start's finished, but I just want to make uh, wait at least until the EGT starts to wind down again. That way I know that the peak temperature in this case, it's what, uh, 589, 590, and then it starts to unwind. So that unwinding, back up here, do the number one engine, and it's just the same thing again. Start valves open, core's turning, we're looking for fan rotation, we're looking for 20 odd percent, can't remember the real number, I think it's 20, 22 percent, and uh, hopefully some oil pressure as well. 20 percent, oil pressure's coming up, Fuel goes in. Operation complete. Set parking brake. So we'll, with the 737, I think you hold it on the tow brakes and then you bring the lever, but it's easy enough. And it's connecting tow, stand by. Nice. So again, this, this is the point where the Airbus makes it easy, but the 737, you've got some buttons to push and that, but you know, some switches to flick. That's the good thing about it. So that's a good start as well. On the overhead then, let's put, let's get rid of the pushback. We'll put Gen 1 on, we'll put Gen 2 on. Now the uh, APU Gen is finished. I'll put the probe heats on. I'll come down here. I'm going to make sure I select the APU bleed off. And then it's packs on departure of the day. I'll put both packs on. I'm going to make sure I switch from ground to flight mode for the pressurization. So is disconnected and bypass pin has been removed. Hand signal on the left. We'll see you next time and have a safe flight. Excellent. Oh, I've got a duct over here. I should probably reset that. Let me just switch the pack off again. How did I manage that? It's because I don't think I had that on. Let's see if that does it. What have I done today? Right, there's a reset, trip reset up here somewhere. It's this one here. There we go. One. And two. That's better. I should probably have had the research fans on. So we've got pressurization system working. We've got flight mode up here. I think we want continuous ignition for the departure. And we want to make sure the APU is uh, off. Having done that, it's the normal flying stuff. 
flaps to 5, we don't arm the speed brake on the 737, we we'll check the rudder trim is set appropriately and our takeoff trim was um, about 4.4%, uh, 4.4 degrees. Did he go? Yeah, I think he went. God, he was so impatient. Right, I think we've done that. So if we think we've done everything, push the warning panel here, check all the lights have gone out, quick check on the overhead. The only things we've got are the ram air doors there. Everything else, we've got fuel pumps on, we've got elects on, uh, hydraulics on, window heat and pito. Excellent. Let's taxi out to runway uh, 33. So we are going to go basically ahead, left, and then all the way down to Sierra, to Sierra 1. So we're clear on the left side, clear on the right side, and off we go. Feeling the pressure of having a 737 skilled pilot watching what I'm doing in the chat always adds a bit of, uh, of interest. Thanks for all the assistance, Marco. Much appreciated. Quick brake check there, and we'll taxi out. So I'm going to take not the first left, but the second left. And you'll see that my viewpoint is quite far back on the aircraft. We'll have a look at that in, in the flight. I mean, normally you'd be a lot closer. You'd be kind of down about here. But it just means that it's harder to see what's going on on the instruments. So because I'm sitting a bit further back, I have to be a bit higher as well. Uh, and that means the horizon in the window is not quite where it would be, uh, as I remember the, the 737 flight down. Yeah, you just touch the brake pedals and, and they come off, uh, Toto. A blessing and a curse, depending on how you look at it. On the taxi out, I'm going to make sure the weather radar is pointed up. We'll flick it to on, and I shall put the TCAS system to uh, above in this case. And we've already got the auto brakes to RTO. I think I should probably have done the flight control check before releasing the, the parking brake in a 737. It might be okay to do it on the move. I do see lots of them sitting there and doing the checks before taxi. On the Airbus, you can do it on the move. But yeah, this is a very immersive little model. The The sound of the aircraft, uh, the cockpit shake on it, is really very good. Can everybody hear the uh, aircraft okay? One of the things is that it uses an older sound engine, and it has a habit, I think, of changing the X-plane sounds. So if the sound balance doesn't sound right to you on the stream, let me know. It sounds okay in my um, headset, but that's never a guarantee. It's just a, a nice looking aircraft. Flybe operated these for a few months back in 2005 out of Birmingham, um, but I don't think it was very successful. Flybe um, run into issues whenever they get jets. It seems Flybe are best placed when they have turbo props. Excellent, that's good to hear. Thanks very much, guys. It is just um, the sounds, when this came out for X-Plane 10, the sounds were amazing. So I probably don't need to uh, hold off. I think I'm good to go. We've got the ignition on, so I'm going to put the landing lights on. I'll take the runway turnoff lights off because I believe they can get uh, disturbed if we uh, take off with them on. So. Headlights are on, strobes are on, auto thrust comes to arm. Yeah, they did a few, at the start of the pandemic, uh, Toto Flyby kind of disappeared. Um, I've got a lot of friends that flew for Flyby. I fly with a lot of first officers that came from Flyby. And um, without wanting to get too soppy about it, Flyby uh, essentially helped me keep my family together when I was flight training. Their domestic flight frequency is why um, I was able to see my daughter and my wife at the weekends when I was training uh, for commercial flying. So I've got um, lots of happy memories of Flyby and the little dashies. Right, we are lined up on the runway here. We've done pretty much everything. I'll just double check. We shouldn't obviously wait on the runway for too long, but it is VATSIM. So I'll open this up here and we'll say Jersey uh, 43 Charlie, Birmingham departing at runway 33 Birmingham. Right, so what I'm going to do is, if I remember my joystick bindings, I'm going to advance the thrust levers up till I get to about 50%. And 
and then I'm going to push the toga button. We get N1 toga and heading select. On the classic, you can arm LNAV on the ground, so it's always heading select. Up she comes, and we've got these ghost throttles now, so it's disconnected. There's 80 knots, that's checked. V1, rotate. Positive climb, gear up. Touch fast on the rotation. I'm just slightly out of trim, that's why. 400 feet, I can engage LNAV. There's LNAV. There's me moving the trim. And above a thousand feet, I'll put the autopilot in. When we do that, it's Command A and it's gone to MCP speed. We're looking for that power reduction at uh, 1500 feet. It says N1 and it's made that reduction. With N1, we'll use that as the trigger to go to 210. We could do that with VNAV, but I prefer this way. There's 210. Above the plus 15 index, flaps 1. Thanks to Matium. Thanks for joining us. It should be on video on demand uh, in the morning as well. Hope you have a good evening. So, flaps 1. And as we come through 190 knots, I'm going to go to flap 0. Is it turning at 2 miles? Flaps to zero, and what I'm waiting for is to the, see the flaps come up and the lights go off. So flaps up, no lights. I'm going the wrong way, really. I'm not really pointing south towards Geneva, but we'll go up to 250 knots. And once it's clean, we can set the brakes off, uh, the RTO mode off, and the gear goes to up and off. Continuous ignition can go off, and just double check the flaps there. Also, looking over here, making sure we are pressurising, this would be the moment we put the packs on if we wanted to. Climbing away, we're going up to 6,000 feet, so I'll intervene, we'll pop it into VS mode, and I'll set 1,500 feet. Yep, we've got mouse wheel uh, manipulators, Toto. Um, some of the mouse wheel manipulators are fairly slow, so some of them it's better to drag with, uh, and some of them it's better to scroll with. Unlike the Airbus, we've got to keep this heading bug up to date all the time, so I'll just point it uh, the way we're going. And just momentarily, if I pop onto the uh, VOR mode, we can see that we are centralised as well. So we've got good navigation from the FMS. And we're on our way to Geneva. I just, I just love the way this thing goes down the runway. I love the cockpit vibration. It's not overdone. Um, the sounds on it are just superb, I think. Happy memories of this little aeroplane. Marco, what, would you always use the continuous ignition on a departure, or is it only in adverse weather? And would you switch it on after star, or when you get to the runway? I'm just curious, because the Airbus does all these things for you. There's Alt Acquire. There's nobody else, so let's just go up to cruising altitude. So I'm going to do level change. You see the, the scroll wheel toto is fairly slow, but if I make some space on the screen, I can kind of plays my way through it a lot quicker with the click and drag. It's just it's just one of those things about it being an older generation aircraft. And as Marco was saying before, if we had the speed uh, or the altitude intervene, we could use VNAV, but now I'm above. If I try and do VNAV just now, it won't let me do it, and that's because it's got those altitude restrictions in there. You see 5,000 above and 6,000. If I clear those out, I get VNAV. Where's my TAT? It's over here. Not TAS. TAT plus 9. You know where at the top of it, it's no problem. Yep, continuous ignition for anti ice and uh, after star. Excellent, thank you. Does it really. This is a, a thing we were talking about on a Discord server earlier, Marco, as well. That when it's turned over the waypoint here, it's what I would call is like a turn back rather than um, intercepting the, the track. It's gone beyond it. Uh, and then turned back online. I'm guessing they don't do that for real. Oh, Laminar don't have acceleration for the mouse wheel? That's a bit, um, that's a bit crummy. 
heating elements. I think they are heating uh, sensors, Jono. The, the windscreen heats are controlled. Uh. Anyway, above 10,000 feet, let's just wind the speed up to around about 285, I guess. Okay, yeah, I thought that would be the case. This is one of these X-plane oddities. At 285, we'll have the landing lights off. In the UK and Europe, you don't need to wait till flight level 100 with the landing lights. You can have them off whenever you want. But on the lovely 737, they're flush mounted. They're not like the Airbus where they hang out into airflow. So you may as well have them on. Uh, lights are off and we can have the... Where is it? Seat belts. Put the seat belts to auto and then they'll come back on again if I forget all about them. Double checking the pressurizing. It's 20 past midnight, so that's uh, good for flight level 100 or so. Yeah, some of them. Um, is it the classic Toto? I've seen lots of variants on the 737, but yeah, they are. They're here somewhere, aren't they? They are there. Those are the outboard landing lights. So some of them have got body lights, and some of them have got them on the canoe fairing here. Um, I tend to use the inboards. I think if you've got body lights, the operators tend not to use them because they you can get damaged fairly easily. It's been in service for such a long time, the 737. Um, I really, really wanted to fly it, um, but it was the Airbus for me. So. Is the wheel turning in the well? That's a good question. Just a bit. Is it supposed to do that? I don't know. Maybe that's an X-plane thing. X-Plane does seem to suffer from um, wheels continuing to rotate for an alarmingly long period of time. Shouldn't be spinning, no. This, um, on the uh, nose gear, Jono, um, because the nose gear doesn't have brakes, unless you're a weird 727 short fuel performance mod, the, um, there's something called a snubber bar, which is like a rubber block that the wheels come up in contact, and that stops the wheels from spinning. The Airbus doesn't have that, so if your front wheel's out of um, balance, even slightly, you get vibration for a long time after the departure. Whereas on the 737, apparently you can smell burning rubber if uh, if you get the speeds just right. Yep, it should apply the brakes. Um, John, pretty much any uh, aircraft where the wheels retract, um, it's important that the brakes are applied before you retract the gear. Most modern big aircraft will sequence a brake cycle before they do it. But the whole point is, if you look at the aircraft from the outside, the wheels retract sideways, okay? Uh, so they'll be spinning forwards at 140, 150 knots. As soon as you rotate them around the axis, you swing them up this way, that puts a gyroscopic twisting load into the gear legs, and you really want to avoid that. So they, they brake them instead, they put a brake on them. Yeah, exactly. At that break, it just stops the stops the twisting effort on. Turn the wing root and turn the nose itself. That's useful. That's flight level 200. We're climbing flight level 350 and I'm going to use 1013. So we are on standard across the board. I'm going to get rid of these extra bugs so I don't confuse them for my landing speeds. And I'll leave 210 as my minimum clean. The FO it's probably still on Tinder, so we'll get rid of those. Set to 10. There we go. And icing speeds, uh, Mark, or icing temperatures, I'm guessing it's uh, plus 10 tat down to minus 40 sat. <laughs> I don't know. It depends, Jono, it depends. Perfect, yeah, thanks Marco, that's the same as the, the Airbus. It makes sense, it's the similar engines. So those of you that don't have the IXCG, what do you think about it so far? What do you think about the, the flight deck? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you don't want halogen lights. LED taxi lights are the best thing ever. Especially at an airfield where you don't really know the layout that well. They only have lights in the wing route. Oh, okay. You see, I'm, I know there's lots of variations on the 737. 
Um, what have I done? Where's my Where's my eyebrow windows? I don't want winglets. I want eyebrow windows. That's better. And you can take the little covers off as well. But one of the great things with this age aircraft, these eyebrow windows are a maintenance thing. So lots of companies will remove them and plate them over, but you'll still see the you'll still see the cover plates for them. Whereas on the production line, uh, initially they plated them over at the factory and then later they changed the skin so they didn't have any holes for the eyebrow windows. It was originally due to the FAA requiring a degree of visibility in the turn. So obviously you bank at 30 degrees, you can't see where you're going. So you have to look down like this, but you've got it to overhead instead. Holds in the FMS, I don't think so. I don't think it does that. It'd be nice if it did. There, uh, Jan and um, Tom, the, the remaining team that are working on this, are committed to getting it up to scratch, up to standard, the modern standard. Um, but at the moment, it's, I, I still think it's very usable. I still think it provides an awesome experience. It's a different proposition now that Zebo is available. Um, because if you want to fly a 737, you've got the Zebo option, right? What you don't have is, I don't think you have the same level of immersion in the Zebo as you do in the IXEG. Now, whether that's worth the price tag in 2021 is a decision you'll have to make yourself. Um, when I bought this, Zebo wasn't available, and this was my entry into X Plane. I got X Plane to fly this aircraft. Um, simply because I wanted to fly the 737. I, I'll make no bones about it. I, I love the Airbus. It's a nice aircraft. Um, but I would have wanted to spend some time on the 737. It, it'll climb exactly like it's supposed to climb Toto. Even after, you know, umpteen X-plane revisions, it still does exactly what it's supposed to do. The, the difference, Pilsner, is... Jan knows how a 737 flies and knows how a 737 feels and that's reflected in this and for all the technical skill that the Zebo product delivers and it's, it's amazing what he's done I'm not being derogatory about it but I have the same feeling it does feel a bit more clinical than the um, than this does John no I I spent time in a 737 uh, simulator. I did 50 hours uh, training course in a 737 sim. And it was a super course. It was after finishing my instrument rating, we went into the uh, simulator. Just check we are still pressurizing. Yeah, that's fine, max diff. We went into the simulator and learned how to work together as a crew rather than a single pilot. It's called multi-crew cooperation. And then we did jet orientation, which is learning how to manage the aircraft at jet speeds. So I've got lots of happy memories of that because it was almost like a, a stepping stone towards airline flying. And the best thing about it, you go from being a single pilot or flying with an instructor to flying with um, the instructor in the back of the sim and your best friend sitting next to you. So your best friend is flying here and you'll be the captain for one day and then the next day you swap it over. And it was just a really, a really satisfying experience. Um, Downwind Sim, yeah, thanks very much for joining in the chat. Really appreciate it. Glad you like the videos. I try my best to provide content that's um, educational without going overboard on uh, some of the details. But the chats are the, the chats, the Twitch streams are a bit more informal. So thanks for joining and saying hello. It, it's very close, Pilsner, isn't it? I I do suffer from rose-tinted spectacles, as we say in British English, but um, I still love it. It was super fun, Amy. Um, it was just nice. And it's, it's almost the end of flight school as well, because you spend um, almost two years with the same group of people um, just hanging around as a, as a big group. And then you get... To the point you're all going off to your separate airlines and it's almost a goodbye if you like but that one last couple of months 
you get to fly with your best friends as captain and first officer on a day in day out basis. It's great fun. There's MCP speed and Alt Acquire. We're going to cruise a little bit faster so the stream doesn't take all night. We'll wind her up to Airbus speeds. 0.77 should do. And at this point, you know, I could VNAV from here, I think. It'll just go a bit slower. Let's go 77. Yeah, it's it's super super funny me. Here we are at our cruising altitude. There is, if I'm not mistaken, that's Heathrow in London down there. So we are basically flying towards the south coast. We'll be flying over where we flew the Saab um, a couple of days ago. There's somebody departing uh, zero eight right. Okay. Oh, there at Gatwick. We should be able to see Gatwick. Do I have display labels turned on? Hang on, I've lost my bearing. There, they're there. Excellent. 747 would be awesome, Jono, for the MCC. Everybody that flies the 747 that I know, everybody that flew the 747 that I know, said it's just a very pleasant aircraft to operate. And the V-speeds are a lot faster in some cases than this. Right, so having got to the top of climb, um, I should probably have set that to standby power just to keep an eye on that there. Otherwise, pressurization is good, temperature is reasonable. Everything else looks A-OK. -okay. Fairly straightforward. You've got the alerters here. Notice they've got different things on both sides. These are basically attention getters. They'll, they'll tell you which panel to look at and if you click it, it'll check. So if there's something uh, showing, if it's got an issue, you click that, it will show up. Or it will show up by itself, but you can use that as a check as well. All right, that's uh, arrival into Gatwick. So let's have a look at Geneva. Let me just check one thing because how the rest of this plays out depends on whether Geneva air traffic control is online. It doesn't appear to be. Right. So if we go to the charts, let me close these down. Where'd you fly out of Marco? Where's your, if you don't mind, you don't have to answer, but it'd uh, be interesting. LSGG. Even the country would do. We're going to fly the uh, Lussar arrival. Uh, it was one of these. So both of those arrivals, Lussar 2 November 2 Romeo. We'll go down to Lussar and we'll trundle down. We either go left for runway 22 or right for runway 04. Central European cargo operator. Oh nice, okay. I've got a friend that used to fly um, 737 uh, freighters and they used to carry race horses around with them. Oh yeah, Jono, you'll not find a 747 pilot that will not talk at length about the 747. They just, they just love it and I would have loved to fly it personally. But you know, we make our, we make our career choices and, and here we are. So, one of the issues with Geneva is there's a, a line of terrain to the north of it and it's fairly high platform altitudes for the ILS. We have to either go this way or we go this way. So let's work on the basis that air traffic is going to be offline and we'll load the, um, we'll load the approach onto 2-2 simply because it's a little bit more scenic flying over the lake. Uh, ILS approach runway 2-2. Okay. So let's just walk through what we've got on the aircraft and see how that fits with um, what we have on the chart. I'm going to delegate supervising the aircraft to our first officer at the moment. So I'm going to be heads down doing some stuff on the computer here. He's going to be using in-flight Wi-Fi, stuff like that. Come on, mouse. Oh, it's done that again. Right, let me move that out of the way. Let me put that there. 
We put this here. Right, I think we're there. Um, excellent. So, all I want to do is to step through the flight plan and make sure what I've got on the FMC is what we expect to have on the chart. Okay. Now, this is where the um, IXCG shows its its weakness a little bit, and that's the VNAV functionality. At Yearning, I've seen them in um, is it Naples, I think I remember seeing um, Italian Post 737s in Naples. There was also uh, there's um, Blue Panorama, still operate the Classic. Um, it's, there's, the, you see quite a few of them in southern Italy. There's a few white tail ones around as well that look a bit wasp for wear. But I'm sure they're fine aircraft. Uh, Lusar, above flight level 350. So there's nothing showing in bold on here. Oh, do you live just outside? Naples is a wonderful part of the world. It's really scenic, really pretty. It's a shame they built the runway on a hill, but you know, you can't have everything. Uh, Lusar, above flight level 200. We've got 350 in there, not a problem. Sony, Flight level 160 or above. Oh, Marco, it's a beautiful part of the world. Um, I don't get down there as much as I used to. Lurker, 8,000 or above. That's fine. Down here, down towards uh, Dinig, there's no altitude constraint on there. Then Sovad, 8,000 or above. Now, this is, you can see it's kind of it's not doing exactly what you'd expect it to do. I don't know what you'd expect it really to do. I'd expect it to show the achieved altitudes, not the target altitudes. Um, it's more reliable than it used to be, so maybe this is a function of some of the tidy up they've done. Okay, But down towards Sovad at 8,000 feet. I want to make sure that I get to Sovad at 8,000 feet. I don't want to be left far too high. Okay. And the reason VNAV might leave me high, even on a fully working implementation, is because of the track miles. It doesn't know how far out and how far back we're going to go, how far out downwind and then how far uh, upwind we'll have to fly. Okay, So I want to make sure I get to Sovad at flight level 80. Rather than messing around with this, which we could do something with it, it may not work for us. I'll simply put a fixed page in here. And I'll put Sovad. Okay, we got a working fixed page on here, which is great. And then it gives me the distance. You're right, Toto. It's got the disco. We'll come back to that in a second. But this this allows me to do my three times table and plan to get down to eight thousand feet. Okay. Back on the legs page, as uh, Toto has pointed out, the reason it's having trouble calculating it is because of the discontinuity. Okay. Um, you can see that we've got Sovad. Then it's the 507, and then it's the 514 point. You see it on the ND here. Okay, and then it just continues off because you get vectors at Geneva being turned in. Okay, so rather than going all the way uh, beyond 514, I'm going to tell the aircraft that at the 514 point, rather than the vectors, I want to use. Uh, what we got 801 can we put golf golf 801 we should be able to do that uh sorry 811 golf golf 811 let's see if that works and then if i uh i was going to clear the discontinuity i'll move petal up there and i go back to my previous page and then i should be able to bring golf golf 811 on there if i execute that now let's step through it so it's the 514, which is all the way down here, and then it turns in to the 811, and then it goes to Petal. Um, and that should work. So at Geneva, I'm not going to fly the whole ILS from Sompre out here. That's I've never done that. I will get turned in by air traffic and descended into the valley. I'm probably going to go down to around about 5,000 feet. Okay. And 5,000 feet is roughly the Golf Golf 811. So what I've got on there is a sensible 5,000 foot point. Okay, the track uh, cross track miles. It's about uh, five or ten miles cross track. If I want to be 5,000 feet at Golf Golf 851, then six and a half, seven thousand feet downwind would work. And what we've got on the altitudes here, 6,100 and 5,000. Okay, 
So we've got a plan to manage our descent into Geneva now. It still says 4,000 at the Golf Golf. Yeah, it, it's just one of those things, Pilsner. I, it, it struggles with this. Um, the VNAV stuff's being uh, fixed at the moment. But I hope you'll see it shouldn't really be an issue as we fly it. I flew this with full VATS and control, um, flying it like I would fly uh, a real aircraft into Geneva. And I didn't use the VNAV once because the controllers needed an early descent. And by the point I was sufficiently low enough it wasn't an issue. We need to load the ILS as well. The frequency is 108.7. Um, I put that on there and on here. I'll confess that I don't know how the uh, FMC deals with that. I think the FMC just uses a DME. Uh, in fact, we could have a look at that. We've got... Uh, maybe it's not implemented. I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to mess it and break with it. But basically, uh, these radios are now tuned to the ILS frequency. And we're going to set 224 for the, um, for the approach track. 224 there. You can see the acceleration if I scroll it this way. Um, and if I use the mouse wheel, it's a bit slower. Minima, we are a Category uh, C aircraft. So our RVL is 550 meters, that's fine. And minima is 1570. Put it on here, 1570. And whilst we're on the same subject, our field elevation was uh, 1400. So we'll just double check up here that we've got uh, 1200 set in the landing elevation. So that should really be that. For the landing, I'll use uh, Auto Brakes 2. And on the ground rollout, where's my airport chart? Airport. So we are going to land on runway 22, vacate at Delta. I need the other chart as well here. Where's my parking stand? This one here. So yeah, see these hotspot markings here? The way it works at Geneva is if you're landing on runway uh, 22, if you vacate a Delta, you should be safe because we'll send outbound traffic this way, the inner taxiway. But if you vacate at Charlie, you could be head to head with an aircraft taxiing out. So Delta's the one for us this evening. All the charts are sequenced, all up to date. And we've got a good plan of action for getting downhill. So how are we doing with the descent calculations? Well, it says Geneva at 20.04. That's fine. That's an hour and a half from now. That's not going to be quite right. If I look on the descent uh, or the cruise page here, my top descent is at 19.13. So that's not too bad. Not too long, really. And that should come forward a little bit. I've been very lazy. I've done it Airbus style and forgot all about the heading yet again. Bring that heading to the head of the aircraft. Let's have a look outside, see where we are. Oh, we're not even over the channel. They're just something about the look of the of the short fuselage 737. It's I think it's a much nicer looking thing than the NG. It's just much more classical looking than the the bigger aircraft. Is it somewhere on the notes preferred? It usually is, um, Toto. Let's have a look. We are looking for a reference. No. Nope. Approach. Where was I? It was airport, wasn't it? Do we have notes? Airdrome briefing. Noise abatement, nighttime operations, reverse thrust, auxiliary power. Nope, not that one. This one here. Parking information, arrival, ILS approach, vector from the north, latest 11 miles, so that gives you an indication where you're going to be. Not on that chart, let's have a look at chart 3. It's easier on an iPad. Nighttime operations, cat 2, 3 operations. It's usually in here somewhere. Minimum runway occupancy. Okay, there we go. Taxiway Charlie shall not be used except on air traffic control instruction. 
So that's that's the reason for it. Now, I'll be honest, we don't tend to check everything that these say on every single sector. Okay? If there's things that have shown to have an operational impact, i.e. lots of pilots get it wrong repeatedly, then there'll be a note appears on the briefing sheets for it. Um, otherwise, it's really just information. It's, it's just root knowledge. You know, we, we talk about line training on an airline. Um, if you're new to airline flying, that's learning the aircraft and learning how to operate it. But also, it's learning where you fly to. Uh, you'll fly with experienced pilots. Um, and it's one of the things, if you change fleets or you change companies as a captain, um, you're really dependent on your first officer's knowledge. Um, I could be flying somewhere in the not too distant future that I've never been to before, but my FO will have been there loads of times. And that's where you really, you are working as a team. It, it's often seen outside the industry as being uh, the captain and the captain's assistant, but it really isn't that way. The, the first officer is there, is as important, uh, as useful as the captain. You know, you really have to know how to work as a team to get the to get the job done. And that's what makes it enjoyable. You know, when it all works right, it's it's really nice. Excuse me while I mute you for a few seconds. I've got a bit of a dry throat this evening, so just check on my Vatsim map. We have got oh dear, we've got 737800 ahead of us. They're at 37 plus thousand feet. Can we see them? Can we see them on TCAS first of all? If I set my range to something sensible, I start. Got my TCAS set above? I do. It's on. And maybe a bit far away. Nope. I see nobody. All is good. So yeah, the, the for me, the thing that I would like to see fixed is the VNAV. Not because it annoys me greatly, but it's because it's the thing that holds people back from using the aircraft, I think. Um, and I know why it's important. I know why it's important in the sim, because you don't have air traffic controllers to help vet you half the time. Um, for me, it's not a big issue, but I'd like to see it fixed so that more people can enjoy the aircraft. And flying holds as well. Yeah, I never really worry about that until I started flying online, but I can see why it's important. Flying a hold manually is fairly high workload. Yeah, the 732, I, I don't have that. Um, yearning, I, I've i got the older 727, um, 727 version 2. It was modified to work on X-Plane 11, but it never really worked properly. This The Fly JSM 727 is the most expensive add-on I don't use. Um, I bought version 1, I bought the update to version 2. I bought a livery pack for it, I bought the SIVA for it, and I hardly ever fly it. Um, and I've been tempted to get version 3 simply because I love the way the 737 looks. I love T-tail 3-engine aircraft. But it, I don't know. Maybe if SIVA was better, I would, um, I would enjoy it more. The SIVA frustrates me a little bit. I need the 732 for shared flight. Yeah, that would be good, huh? I think this is, I think this is a, a nice aircraft to operate as a crew. Sab three forty would be good on shared flight as well. So the the classic seven three sevens, the three hundred and the four hundred, they're very similar. Um, there's a difference on the four hundred, and I can't remember. There's another switch up here. Um, is it another set of recirculation fans? There's something on the 400 that you've got an extra switch up here and if you look on the outside there's like a, a missing window that's something to do with a, a riser for the air conditioning system as well. I can't remember. Yeah, I'm hoping the the Felis uh, SIVA 
works as expected at Yarning. I was speaking to Felis a fair bit about it in the early days of him developing it. Um, but fingers crossed. But if JSnap's doing a SIVA as an external plugin, then yeah, 100% that would be the way to go. Oh, okay, you deactivate it on the freighter. That makes sense. How's the tail clearance on the 400, Marco? I know the 800 has got very high speeds compared to other aircraft of its weight class, and I know part of that's the tail clearance. But the 400 isn't much shorter than an 800. Do you have issues with the tail? Especially at Naples. I'm always really nervous taking a, a 320 into a Naples, a 319. Although the 19 and the 20 officially, uh, you would still call pitch at 10 degrees, the 19 you've got a bit more margin in it. The 321 is seven and a half degrees and that's very close, very tight, uh, landing on 06 at Naples. 11 degrees is it's reasonable. Do you enjoy flying it? Do you have happy days out in the 737? Oh, 9 for the NG. Excellent. Is there actually a is there a SIVA in the works from Fly J Sim or is that something that we're we're not able to find out at the moment? Because if they had a, a dedicated um SIVA for their classic airliners, that would be fantastic. A proper working dual updating, realistically behaving SIVA would be sweet. Hey, thanks, Diamond Sim. I uh, hope you have a good dinner. Thanks for, thanks for joining and saying hello. It's always nice to see somebody new in the chat. I'll try and make these um, streams as regular as I can. Um, just depends on what goes on at work. But thanks for stopping by. Have a good night. Got some new subscribers as well. Uh, open somersault. Thanks very much for subscribing. Hope you're still there. So how are we doing on the fuel? Uh, we have got four tons on board. Our fuel flow is about um, one ton an hour. That's fine. So we've got two hours until tanks dry and we should be on the ground in not more than an hour really. Excellent. Lots of people use Simbrief for flight sim planning and I understand that you're looking for the most realistic experience possible. I, what I do for fuel planning, well, for a start on the 737, it's easier um, because is this going to break if I click it? It's not. You've got a fuel calculator on here, but with any aircraft, any smaller transport jet, 737, A320, that sort of thing, if you've got a fuel figure in mind for the first hour and a fuel figure in mind for every subsequent hour, then that's all you really need to be roughly in the ballpark. You know, for an Airbus 320, you're talking about three and a half tons for the first hour and two and a half tons for each hour after that. So if you are on a two hour flight, then it's six tons. Then you put another couple of tons on for your reserves and you're good to go. It doesn't have to be hyper realistic. Um, if you want to use Simbrief, then go right ahead and do it. That's great. But if you're like me and you find things like that get in your way of flying, then just put some fuel on and go fly. You're not paying for the fuel, so it's all good. I like my simming to be... Uh, I want it to be fun. I want it to be semi-realistic, but I don't want it to feel like work. You know, I want it to be relaxing as well. Crossing over northern France. Have we got a... Uh, we do have... Let me put the... Uh, oh, yeah, it's got lots of airports in France. 
I do kind of wish it filtered these based on the ones that it could actually land at. LFOB, that rings a bell. Can't remember any of those. It gets in the way. It's not so much it gets in the way, Amy, it's just that it's just something that happens in the background. Um, so when I'm flying an airliner sim, um, like the I'm going to use the, the Zebo as an example. And if anybody's watching the sim and you're, you're not in the chat, I don't want you to get the wrong idea about what I'm about to say. Because the Zebo is a fantastic piece of work. It's really enjoyable. It's really detailed. And the amount of work that's gone into that thing is incredible, especially for a free product. If it was a payware product, it would be incredible. But for a free product, it's incredible. Okay. Having said that, as an airline pilot, I don't have to know how many passengers I have on board unless we've got an emergency. Okay. What I see on the load sheet. Now, this has been done by an airline pilot. What I see on the load sheet is a payload. Okay. I see that I've got, for example, eight tons of people. That's that's all it is. It's a weight in the aircraft. Okay. I don't know how many bags are in the rear hold and how many bags are in the forward hold. I just get told what the CG is and I do my calculations based on that. Okay. Similarly, a lot of the things that you miss in the sim are the prompts. So my cabin crew will come and tell me, I say, that's half the customers on now. And then the dispatcher will come and say, that's boarding complete. You don't have to you don't have to go into an iPad and click buttons to close doors. All that stuff happens whilst you're concentrating on flying the aircraft. Now, if you want to simulate the full airline experience, the full, the, the, doing the role of everybody on the airport, then yeah, you can do that on the Zebo for sure. But if you just want to fly it, all you want really is to set yourself a time on the clock and say, it's 10 to seven at the moment, the doors are closing at seven o'clock and we're going to start the engines at five past seven and just work to that. All the other stuff you have to do is just something that happens in the background. Um, and I think, I think that's really where developers should be, should be um, looking at improving how it feels to be an airline pilot in the sim. Simply giving you a target to aim for to get the checks done, giving you a knock on the door from the cabin crew saying, "We're ready. Are you ready?" Sort of thing. Uh, Marco, the IXEG team, they were, they had big plans about five years ago. They were going to do a four hundred and they were going to do a freighter. Um, I, I think realistically what you'll get at the moment is the 300 and the 300 working quite well in the future. I, I don't know what the future has for them, but they've got other projects uh, that they're working on individually as well. So Jan that does the, um, the, he's the technical consultant, if you like, for the model. And I think he does a lot of the flight dynamics as well, or some of the flight dynamics. Jan also does a lot of airports for the airport gateway. And Tom, who's the uh, the lead artist and the systems coder, he's got some other projects of his own he's working on as well. So I think, never say never, but I think this is what you'll get from the IXEG team. How heavy is it on system resource? Good question. Let's have a look. 3J FPS says I'm doing 30, 40 frames a second. It is. There you go. It's running Gizmo, obviously. Uh, why is it coloured at the same colour? That's a bit weird. Not too bad. This. Jono, this would run on X-Plane 10 adequately on my computer. It would run without um, Vulkan quite happily as well. It, w it, it never caused me any issues uh, like some of the other aircraft have. X-Plane 10, it was a lot harder on the 
on the ground textures. I think X-Plane 11 has been optimised a lot over its life. Uh, when I first got X-Plane 11 it ran better than 10 ever did. I think it's it's probably a touch lighter than the I don't know is it lighter than TBM? No, I, maybe not. Maybe it's about the same as the TBM. Um, I can't remember what the values were from my uh, TBM flight. It's probably very similar to the TBM, to be honest. I don't like X-Plane's lighting change. I wish it would occlude the flight deck. The, the reason it's done that is because the, the sun's behind us. Uh, X-Plane doesn't really know that the the cockpit lighting should be occluded by the rest of the... the rest of the uh, body. 4 milliseconds per frame? I, I honestly can't remember, Toto. Um, Trying to think. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps the TBM's lighter than this. And so I don't really. You know that I've got a very old machine. It's an i5 2500K. Um, I don't worry about the, the frame rates as long as I'm not getting stutters from the system. I don't worry about add on scenery because. Um, well, it's just not really my sort of thing. I, I like flying the aircraft, I like flying realistic procedures. I'm not so fussed on on simulating the airport ground environment. We have got 138 miles to top descent. Looking at my fix page, I've got 193 miles to Sovad. So at Sovad, I want it to be 8,000 feet. Uh, it says above 8,000 feet. I want to be at 8,000 feet to give me some options. I'm at 35,000 feet just now. So if I take uh, 8 off that, that takes us down to what? 27. 3 times that. Uh, shall we just say 90 miles? At 90 miles from Sovad, I want to start the descent. And that will cover us for any shortcut. You see what the aircraft is looking at, what the top descent calculation uh, here is looking at is the whole of the track, but this is simply calculating direct to Sovad. So if I was to go direct to um, Lusar at the moment, it wouldn't change. In fact, probably a good thing to do. I just double check there's no air traffic that's going to get annoyed by me doing this. No, we are all good. Why am I saying somebody else's flight plan? Right, let's go from here and we'll just go Lusar. There we go. Execute. I can put any waypoint out and get advisor information of the sand. Let's have a look. So this is the part, um, Marco, where it's not fully implemented, I don't think. Um, changing things like uh, going from econ descent to speed descent, that can trip it up at the moment. Um, anything in the downhill phase of the flight if you mess with it, it can get um, it can get things wrong. Where would you normally do that? Would be that would that be on the on this side here or on the forecast page? I think that's just the wind. On the Airbus, we've got it on the prog or the perf page. You see things like the fuel calculation; it doesn't really do a great job with that either. You've been loading X-Plane into New York for 30 plus minutes? Oh my goodness. Yeah, final approach fix. Um, the other thing, um, it does have the fixies. So, a waypoint altitude builds now. Oh, let me look at that. This one here. 
So if I was to say sovad, let's see, let's see what it does. I've got a plan B if it breaks. Uh, would I need an out chip? 8,000. It doesn't seem to accept that, but that's probably me being silly. Nope. Okay, well, I guess it's not there. Hey, Mo Charlie. Thanks for joining the chat. It's been a long time since those series. I look back on those videos and think, wow, was it really that bad? <laughs> was I really that bad? That's a long time ago. I really want to revisit the 737 because it's, it's, um, it's just nice to fly. <laughs> That's very kind. I wouldn't go that far. I think the TBM series, of all the video series that I've done, um, I think the TBM series is the most comprehensive and the most complete. Um, I was exploring a new format with that series and uh, that I was quite happy with how those turned out. Leading Edge DC3, Jono, um, no, I think ELS is still working on it. There's some pictures on the Leading Edge Discord uh, yesterday or this morning of a DC3 with the Avatab and a, a GNS430. Uh, he's thinking about putting in there, but I've not seen anything since that. And the, the 154 series, I enjoyed that yearning, I enjoyed doing it, but the... I don't do the videos for the for the view count. Um, I do them because I want to make the videos. That being said, the the TBM, uh, sorry, the, the Tupolev, the view count on that was just diabolically poor when it first came out. There's one or two people that watch them and then nobody else bothered with them. Um, so it was really about where was I best spending my time and effort and the 154 series got parked as a result of that. And I would want, I want to go back and revisit it again, but it's just finding the time. Um, it's proving a bit more popular now. And I believe there were some plans that Felix was going to open source it when the 747 was released, um, much like he did with the Antonov. And if he open sources the Tupola, that might uh, make it a lot more popular. It's viewed as being quite a difficult aircraft, but actually it's fairly straightforward. I'm just thinking the last thing that I need to do as we're approaching the top descent is put the descent performance in as well. So if I go to a net ref, I'm going to land flaps 30. So I'll put that in here. I've already got the minima set on here. Flap 30, 125. So with a wind increment of plus five knots, that seems reasonable. 130. I'm going to simply bug 130. I'm going to move three of the bugs around. I'll move that one out of the way. And I'm going to put 130 on there. So that's roughly my target speed for the approach. I also want to bug the plus 15 speed. And again, Marco's going to have to help me out here. Plus 15 knots for the uh, go around speed. So you go around flaps 15 and then target the plus 15. Is it 15 knots on the 40 flap speed all the time? Or is it 15 knots on the speed that you're going to use for landing? So would it be today, for example, 140? or uh, 136, the plus 50. Don't know. But bug them up so that you've got the target approach speeds and the plus 15 speed. There's actually some information, you know, Jan went to a lot of work to put manuals in here as well. He's got the flap schedule in here, the fixed flap schedule for you. And you've got the, oh, let me do that one required landing distance tables and you've even got a descent helper so if your VNAV really isn't working and you you want to use the rule of thumb you've got it on here for your reference as well okay double bug the selected VREF which is 125 okay so not with increment that's fine and plus 15 on the VREF so if it's flaps 30 140 that makes sense yeah I can I can buy into that so 125 and 140. Excellent. Thanks, Marco. Again, the Airbus just does all this for you, so in as well. VRF plus 5 is a minimum. Okay. 
nice. And if you're above a certain speed, uh, above a certain weight, sorry, I think it's 50 something tons, you would put 10 knots onto all the config speeds. So you'd use 220 rather than 210 as the clean speed. Yeah, GS Mini, a blessing and a curse, Marco. It's good most times. It, it only keeps a five knot margin on your flap limiting speeds. So if you're in turbulent days with a strong headwind, it can get you really close to your, your flap limit speeds. 53.8 tons, perfect. I don't think we're close to that just now. I'm looking for the flight deck lighting. There we go. Exchange. Excellent. Making progress. Yeah, it's all quiet on Vatsim this evening. What else have you all been flying today? You've been in the sim today, have you been having fun? I know Amy's been flying the Saab recently. How's that new computer working out, Pilsner? Is it, uh, is it doing the job for you? Or are you still waiting for it to finish installing? X-Plane does sunsets really well. Sab this morning, Islander hops in the afternoon. How are you liking the Islander, Amy? The piston one? Is it all you hoped it would be? What's taking it so long, Pilsner? Is it indexing something for the... for the... Uh, for the scenery? Because you've got gigabytes of auto, if I remember. And Marco, do you fly in the simulator as well? Do you fly X-Plane or Microsoft Flight Sim as well as doing the job for real? I'm scribbling down what you're saying in my notepad here as well. 53.8 tons. Yeah, it's odd, Amy, isn't it? I, I love the piston and the work they've done on the turbine is incredible. Um, it's so much nicer, but even with that, I go back to the piston more. Wow, Jono, that's a lot of flying today. DR400 glide approaches, nice. MD-18. Oh, excellent. Sky Echo 2. Nice. You fly in the UK, I'm guessing, with a Sky Echo 2. Okay. Well, Marco, um, the if you move to 747, yeah, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? The um, X-Plane's a really good simulator. Um, it's got a fairly um, enthusiastic community. Uh, you've got good models in it. It doesn't maybe have the same uh, breadth of different aircraft as you have in the Microsoft series, or you traditionally had the Microsoft series. But the aircraft that you have, if you pick the right ones, there's a lot of really nice aircraft out there. Um, and there's, there's quite a lot of um, aviational, aviation people fly X-Plane. It does have character, Amy the Islander. There's just, there's just something about it. It just feels quite real. Um, the once it gets the flight model updated, I think it will fly even better. At the moment, my gut feeling is that it's underperforming on takeoff by about 10%. And also, it, um, it sits on the back of the drag curve on the takeoff for a bit too long. So when you're climbing with flaps and the uh, 65 knot climb, it has to haul itself out of that a little bit. Oh, Fairhawk, oh, you're just up the road from me. The Emerald, oh, that's a nice aircraft. So I fly a DR400. Uh, I fly two different DR400s, a 140 and a 160 aircraft. Um, 
they also they've got a a Jodel that I haven't flown yet. It's not been there that long. And they only recently got rid of a Super Decathlon, which was a nice aircraft as well. The MD-11, Marco, looks absolutely superb. Um, it looks really nice. And Rotate have got um, good history in making an enjoyable add-on. The, the A300, there's a stream on the channel. Um, if you look on uh, Twitch Video On Demand, uh, I did a stream on the A300 a few weeks back that you, you might want to have a look at as well. It's it's good fun. It needs a little bit of refinement, the A300. Um, but it it feels different from a from a, a newer Airbus. I've never flown a, a 140, uh, John. I've, got, I've flown a, a Regent, a 180 Regent, and the 160. So the 160 has got the fuselage tank and the aux tank, and the uh, 180 has got the four fuel tanks. The 180, um, one pilot and no passengers on the 180 DR400, and it goes really well. The 160, it's really a three-seater. Yearning, yes. Yes, I do know why that is, and I can't for the life of me remember what it is now. Um, there's some... There's a switch on the left hand side. So on your on the panel where your left knee would be, there's a switch that's got three positions. It's got up, down, and middle. And if you flick the switch up, one of the lights comes on and that gets you taxi steering. Oh you're aware of the switch? Yeah, I wondered so I I couldn't find that for ages. Um but no I've not had any issues with it once once I got the switch in. Squat more Delta. Hey, thanks for joining the chat. You currently waiting in the FCOM for the 737, yeah. Hope you're having a super evening anyway. Oh, I don't know then, uh, Yearning. There may be something odd going on there. Oh, we've gone past the descent point. Shall we go downhill? Might be a good idea. So let's go level change and we'll just go down to, I don't know, 130 or something. There was me chatting away. No big deal. Now the fun begins. Yeah, all oh, right, okay, awesome. I should probably back the speed off a little bit. I'm probably a touch on the hot side here. So are you going to start flying the... Uh, are you reading the FCOM for the Sims Squat Mode Delta or for, for real life flying? There's one other thing I could do here. I've, I've now ruined all my charts, my chart setup. Um, 115.75. If I just put that on this side for a moment. 105.75. Sim in real life in the future. Oh, good. Excellent. This is my distance to Geneva directly. So 80 miles um, plus 10 miles out, 10 miles back. So that's about 100 miles from 31,000 feet. That should work out. I don't have any experience of the of the NG Squat Mode Delta, but um, there's lots of resources out there for the 737 as well. By all accounts, it's an enjoyable aircraft to operate. So in the descent, I'm going to double check, make sure we are de uh, descending the cabin. That's fine. Uh, because I like to chat and forget about things, I'm going to put seatbelts on just now. Everything looks good. So I want to be 8,000 feet at Sovad. That's 20,000 feet to lose. That's 60 miles. And I've got 67. So to be honest, we should be there, thereabouts. Because there's no air traffic, we can actually make this a lot easier on ourselves. If I set flight level 80 in here, then the magic green banana will show me where I'm going to level at. And we can just adjust the VSs required for that.
I, I watch a lot of sim videos where pilots really fly to the extremes of what the VNAV system does. They fly high and fast for as long as possible. Um, there are some real world pilots that do that, but the vast majority would take a more conservative approach and just build in a few extra thousand feet for themselves. So if you get an air traffic shortcut or some change in the flight path, then you don't have to worry about it. You see the, the vertical deviation indicator kind of come into life and then not really being overly happy. You can put the Avatab on the uh, side screen rail here as well, but I tend not to bother with that. It's easier to pick it up like an iPad and, and put it down again. So the green banana thinks that we're going to be uh, okay based on the current descent rate. Obviously we have to slow down as well when we get a bit lower. Right, it's gone over to 300 knots, so let's just bring the speed back to about 280. Hopefully we'll sort ourselves out. So we've got about 15,000 feet to lose. That would need 45 miles and we've got 53, so all is well. Has it actually been loading for that amount of time, Pilsner? That's unbelievable. I already got fed up by now and rebooted it. Are you doing any flight training at the moment, Squat Mode Delta? Are you in the middle of a training course? Or are you are you thinking about the future? Feel free not to answer if you if you don't want to. John, asking Pilsner about the scenery is like asking Pilsner about the aeroplanes. What scenery is Pilsner using? All of the scenery. What aeroplanes does he have installed? All of the aeroplanes. Iron Condor Simulations, thanks so much for the follow. Much appreciated. Let's see if we can see some outside views here. I do love how X-Plane looks late in the evening. The Maybe the colour contrast is not right, not exactly right, but it does look nice. It looks nice. Uh, I should really have my tat... Ah, oh, we're not going to talk... We'll be in and out, it'll be fine. Don't need to worry about the anti-ice just now. <laughs> what are your planes? Yes. <laughs> All of the airplanes, except the Tupolev. So you can see that that um, that VNAV target is oh, the, not VNAV. The vertical deviation is coming down. It's looking reasonable now. We've got ten thousand feet to drop to Sovad, which we need thirty miles. We've got forty. So at the risk of shooting myself in the foot, I'm going to put it in VS mode now and just reduce the VS ever so slightly if I zoom in there and where's the dimmer of the... oh it's on that so this one, it's not that one, it's this one there's one of these lights flicks to life like a fluorescent as well I'm trying to remember which one it is that's the background there, is it this one? The, one of these uh, switches. One of these lighting uh, switches comes to life really nicely. Zero fuel right now. It should be burning about 800 kilos an hour in the descent. Um, it's burning what? Four, 350, 400? Yeah, that seems fairly, fairly close. Oh, it was near zero. Oh, right, okay. Oh, I've put the power on. Hang on. Oh, yeah. No, that's not right, is it? Yeah, no, that's not right at all. There's one for Jan to have a look at. Super fuel efficiency. I did wonder why it was uh, not burning quite as much as I expected. 
I don't know if this is supposed to be used with the experimental flight model or not. I'm not using it with experimental flight model. Maybe it's supposed to have that switched on. Right, 15,000 feet. We are descending the cabin. We've got the seat belts on. I guess that should have been back there at some point. Cozy, huh? There's another light somewhere that I really want to turn on and I can't remember where it is. Is it this? It's not the map light, is it? No. Oh, I should have thought about the timing before having to do a night landing into Geneva. Next to the O2 mask. Oh, there we are. Is it this one here? It's Chinfrey FM. Oh, well, that maybe explains it. Make sure you fly it in experimental flight model, folks. So I'm getting a DME from the uh, runway now, so I can put the Geneva one back. Um, for those of you that aren't X-Plane pilots, X-Plane, uh, default X-Plane puts a hard limit on how far away you can receive nav aids, um, which is a bit of a pain. So if you're far away, you may need to use the VOR rather than the uh, ILS DME. Again, just something you can work with. So now that the VS can come back to around about 100 and, well, 1,300 feet per minute, we should make Sovad quite comfortably. The FDS flood, that's this one up here. Autopilot flight director system, I believe. There's probably some speed limits I should have been paying attention to as well. 250 knots. One of the traps is coming into Geneva at high energy. So I want to slow down when we get uh, towards SOFAD. So I'm trying to get and stay under the profile so that I can have a reduced rate of descent and that will allow me to decelerate without the, um, without the speed brakes. I think it might be the background um, yearning, I think. There's one of them. Can't remember. Alphabet soup. This one. Yeah, there there was a there was a switch for it. I, I can't remember. Right, let me concentrate on doing some pilot stuff for a minute and we'll look at the lights when we've parked on the gate. Huh? I didn't set my transponder to below, my bad. Bring my range in a little bit. One final check. Probably call up Geneva traffic. Geneva traffic. It's a Jersey four three Charlie seven three seven three hundred self positioning for ILS runway two two Geneva. Oh, uh, they don't care about that total two fifty knots below a hundred. Most places you can get away with not worrying about it. It's only got a few knots to come back. That being said, what I'll do is I'll wind it all the way back to clean speed uh, and then we've got the energy state under control for the shortcut. Some aircraft have got a hard limit on 250 knots below 100 due to the um, windscreen bird strike protection, the windscreen limits, but to the best of my knowledge the 737 doesn't have that. Come on manipulators. Yeah, you know, in places like um, Spain as well, it's 12,000 rather than 10,000, so, it, you know, it just comes and goes. You, it, you can be a responsible pilot and fly fast. If it sounds like it's quiet and air traffic don't have MD else they're speaking to, they're not going to mind. Some places you have to slow down, you know, it, it's just how it goes. You can always ask them. Temperature's plus eight, so I'll put the... Uh, Continuous ignition on. I'll put the engine anti-ice on. <laughs> it 
<laughs> yeah, that's it. Get down to the platform and then start slowing up. That's how you do it. Military style. Where's my... There we go. That's what I was looking for. It's full. It's when you put it to full on the background. That's what I was talking about. That's the nice light I was looking for. Exactly that. Um, one of the ways you can get down, if you've been kept high and your energy state is a problem, you can maintain more than 250 knots below 10,000 feet and that lets you get the height off much more sharply because obviously the aircraft predicts a 250 knot descent. That's one way to do it, Amy. You might get some comments if you did that. Let's have a look at the 737 peel off into the turn here. Oh, clouds ruining it. You see an image like that and you have to say in a William Shatner accent, there's something on the wing. Doesn't always work. Litho braking. Uh, 043 is what we're going to go outbound on. So just to remind everybody and me what we're doing is we're going to go down to 5,000 feet and intercept at the Golf Golf 811. From this point onwards I can go down under radar vectors down to 6, 1 and 5. I'm just going to go down to 7 just now. So I'm going to do 7,000 feet vertical speed. Down we go. And remember that Geneva is 1,500 feet field elevation, so I'm only 6,500 feet above the field. So at 7,000 feet, I'll be 5,500 feet above the field. That means I need around about 17 track miles. We've got seven at the moment. And we've got a good five miles cross track. So it's all about keeping that mental arithmetic up. And this is, if you watch the Saab video, this is where the having the nav display available really helps. I'm just going to leave continuous ignition on because I will need it for the uh, the flap extension anyway. And again if you're a sim pilot and you're only flying in the simulator if you've got these georeference charts available this is not cheating in a simulator okay this gives you what you need to self fit to yourself just like air traffic would do. Don't ever regard this as cheating, regardless of what um, you read on the forums. Okay, real pilots work with air traffic controllers to get the job done. This is all you have, then just go ahead and use it. You see, I've slowed down, so my trailer temperature has dropped off, but I don't think we're in ice in conditions. So my display in a little bit. 108.7, 224, 224, there's Alt Acquire. And we can descend down to 6,000 feet now. So in Geneva, flying in there for real, it's fairly common to get a tighter high energy approach. Okay, um, It's just one of these places that happens. They get you over the hill, you turn in and you make it work. It's possible to do that in the simulator. But does that add to your enjoyment of it? Maybe, maybe not. We are 5,300 feet above the field. We need about 15 miles track. I've got 14 out to where I am plus 5 miles cross track. So what I'm going to do is turn on to southeastly heading, so a 90 degree turn onto about 140. I'll just increase the VS ever so slightly. Yep, the Airbus is the same. You get um, we switch off the landing lights early in the takeoff because it saves fuel. You see an Airbus flying around with the lights off at low level because it saves fuel. I'm going to sequence the flight plan now. So I'm going to bring Golf Golf 811 up the top. That's just to keep everything in sequence should we end up flying a missed approach. I take the first stage of flaps and I'll come back to speed 190. Check that we've got the ignition and the lights on. A 
and this is where I'm doing kind of two jobs at once because I'm monitoring my aircraft and also the radar vectors. So I'm at four and a half thousand feet above the field, 15 miles out, and we could probably go down to 5,000 feet like we said. So let's make sure it's still in VS. Below 200 knots, I'll take flaps 5, speed 180. And I'll just knock it momentarily out of heading mode, so it's in control wheel steering, just for a second. I'll spin that round, looking for a 30 degree intercept, and this is a sim thing more than anything else. Back into heading, and you used to have to arm Vorlock, and then approach. I don't think you have to do that anymore. But there we've got Vorlock, GS. I'll back the um, vertical speed off, and hopefully we'll capture the localizer and the glide slope. Amy will help me with the pronunciation. This is a French airfield here. Is it Animas? Animal? Something like that? Just over the French border. Little GA airfield. Scenic Lake Geneva. Mont Blanc, just in the haze there. There we go, sequencing on the localizer. I'm going to set 224. And we didn't talk about the missed approach because I don't plan to go around. But it's uh, not quite coded correctly in the box. I need to set 7,000 feet. Geneva traffic, Janex 818, pushing back from ramp 84 onto Alta. We're in Geneva traffic, it's Jersey 43 Charlie 737300. We are on a 12 mile final for runway 22, Geneva. I forgot I was online there for a second. Let's make sure there's nobody else. There's Chanex. Excellent. So we've got glide slope and localizer. I'll set 7000 for the missed approach. We'll put the second autopilot channel available, although it's still one channel just now. And we're trucking down flaps 5, speed 180. So my next config, I could go down to 170 flaps 10, but typically we put the gear down flaps 15, speed 150. We just configure it from there. So in the absence of anything else, I'll just leave it at 180 knots until about six and a half miles, and hopefully that will work out. Done a reasonable job of the intercept, and just checking there's no detaxing out to depart off runway 04, because we're being a little bit naughty doing this the opposite direction. But I like the view over the lake, and you can see the fountain here in real life as well. Obviously, you can check the glide slope, uh, check altitudes on the way down, Practically speaking, we can see the pappies. That tells us we're reasonably where we need to be. This is where I can't remember which joystick bindings I've used to disconnect everything up. 4 mile decel, not from 180 total. Uh, we do it from 6 miles at 180. So 160 knots in the 737 with the revised speed schedule needs the gear and flap 15. So if we can do 180 to 6, it's better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the gear down. Flap 15, speed 150. Check in. Well, you know. Got to give myself a fighting chance here. It's not going to be butter. I, I'm not good in the 737. Right, next stage of flap. We can go down to 140. And we're going only to flap 30. So the limiting speed is 185. We've got everything available. So there's flap 30, landing flap. And I'll select that uh, 129 for the plus 5 over the VREF. Just reading off the bugs here. Geneva traffic, it's uh, Jersey 43 Charlie. We're on a four mile final runway 22 and we'll be parking on the 40 stand. Probably. Oh, you know what? Gear down, let's arm the speed brake. EG 52 uniform uh, Zulu is also pushing back onto inner for runway uh, 04. Hey, go Toto, 1000 feet within five knots or so of the approach speed. It's about as hot as you ever want it to be, and I was quite slow on getting the final stages out. Stable, within five. We are visual. 
So one of the great things about the IXEG is these ghost throttles here. This is my hardware throttle and this is the aircraft throttle. Okay, now I'm not going to disarm the auto thrust. Checklist not read. Oh, don't be silly. Everything's done. We're good. Right, click the speed button here. That puts the auto thrust to arm. I've now captured it with my throttle. Autopilot's out and disconnected. Click it twice to get rid of the alarm. And we'll just fly it. In Jersey 43, Charlie landing runway 22, Geneva. I concentrate on flying and not on the radio. There we go. Night landings I did not sign up for. COVID furlough, yo. Just hold it there, settle down, spoilers up, reversers, and we've got a decel trend. So Charlie's the first exit, Delta's the second exit. It's all about making it fun, Jono. Don't make it more difficult than it needs to be. It's my philosophy. Right, there's 50 knots. I'll take the auto brakes out and just give it a squeeze on the brakes. Pilsner's going to look in um, Volantina and tell you my landing rate. We've got forward idle, auto brakes disarmed. So this is the point where it gets a bit confusing uh, if you're on the sim because there's lots of things to do at the same time. Let's concentrate on the steering first of all and we'll get rid of the landing lights. And I'll put the taxi and turn off lights on. Make sure my speed is nice and low. I'll stow the spoilers. And now the other pilot's got time to do all the business. Like bringing the flaps up, making sure the auto brake is disarmed. On the overhead, he's going to make sure the pressurization set to ground continuous ignition is finished with. We'll start the APU. Taxiing to runway zero four via outer and golf. And it's Jersey 43 Charlie. We'll be well out your way parking on the 42s. Great stuff, thank you. Have a good flight back, guys. So we are just going to trundle down here, turn left onto Link 3, and then in on to Stand 42. Here's Link 3 just now. Now I'm feeling I've not done something. Let me just get rid of the. I'm just going to stop here actually, make sure we've done everything. So flaps are up, transponder is set to auto with TCAS off, APU is available, we've got the lights and the pressurization. You know, I think we're okay. Don't run the wingtips into buildings, that's generally regarded as a bad thing to do. Those strobes could probably do with going off, eh? Weather radar off, thanks John. Good, isn't it, Toto? Yeah, it's got a weather radar, um, Jono. Now, parking at Geneva is self-parking, which is always good fun, trying to find where we're supposed to go. There, it's there. Right, so they've got the lead-off line, and we'll just park on the stand. So entering the stand, I'll have the turn-off lights off. Can I see where I'm going with the tax light off? No, so I'll leave that on. And we are good to turn on. Uh, Geneva traffic, uh, EZ 52 Uniform Zulu is taxiing to runway 4 via out, uh, inner, outer and golf. So I'll just put the the little washer jet here on the, the top of the combing. From my viewpoint that roughly keeps us where I want to be. Hope those baggage dollies aren't going to be an issue. If we clip through those, so be it. They weren't here the last time I came to Geneva. And these stop lines, these stop lines are marked for the pilot, not for the nose gear. So you would come to a halt when the stop line is in line with you. My joystick definitely isn't breaking. Yeah, it does need some damping, doesn't it, Jono? Right, so the parking brake is set. 
Having done that, we'll not do the Airbus thing. I've shut it down. We'll put the APU Gen on and uh, it's on both buses. Now we can shut it down. Oh, for goodness sake. Really? Why is that happening? I think my button has given up the ghost. Let's try that again. You know, I'm trying to do it the TBM way, and that's the that doesn't work. It's holding the it's holding the brake, Toto. If you hold the brake, it releases the. All is good. Should we stick it into reverse and back up? Nah, we're good. We're still kind of on our stand. There we go. Little simism. Pito Heat is the one I forgot, uh, Marco. Thank you very much. So Pito Heat's off. The generator's uh, on board. If I'd shut the engines down, we wouldn't have gone anywhere, huh? One and two. Uh, we've got a dome light somewhere. Where's the dome light? Not that one. Not that one. Right. Shutting down. Aft overhead. Channex Geneva traffic. No, uh, Channex 818 Geneva traffic taking off from my zero phone. Up here. Oh, yes, I see it. Yep, that's the one. Is that bright? That's apparently the dome light on. Okay, what have we done? We've shut down the engines. Uh, we can have the, uh, the traffic, easy. one of the packs for the customers. Strobe's already off. With the engine spilling down, we'll switch off the county collision light and the transponder can go to 2000 and standby. 2000 and standby. I think Apart from that slight excursion, which the jetty was out of the way, so nobody died as a result. That's us uh, done for the flight, guys. I hope you enjoyed that on the 737-300. I need to work out what's going on with my joystick braking because that's twice I've had the same issue. And I think it's because I'm trying to do it the TBM way, which is holding the brake release while I'm pushing my parking brake button. And I think that's actually going back to releasing the brakes. So apart from that, fairly uneventful. Um, does anybody have any questions about the IXCG model? I'm just going to bring the lights up so you can see it again for a little bit. Yeah, thanks Marco. Thanks for joining us and thanks for the technical input. It, it's always nice to have a, a subject matter expert on the stream who can who can help out and fill in the gaps. This is this has been an aircraft that I've loved flying an X-plane for a long time. Um, and I just hope that they continue to develop it to get it up to modern standards so that everybody can enjoy it the way that I have always enjoyed it, if that makes sense. Toto, you're quite welcome. I always enjoy a little bit of a comedy input. Don't worry about it. Keep it up. It's it's how it's supposed to be. Um, and Yearning, thanks for joining us as well. I really appreciate you coming back to the stream uh, time after time. And everybody else in the chat, if I haven't mentioned you, if I haven't noticed you, um, I do apologise. I hope you're having a super evening wherever you are. Jono, thank you. Thanks very much. Nice to see you. Uh, traffic? You all have a super weekend. Stay safe and stay positive. If you're looking at commercial flight training, um, as you said, uh, you were uh, Delta Hotel, was it? I forgot your name, sorry. Um, stay positive. The world's going to improve in the not too distant future. All will be well. Thanks, folks. Thanks for joining me, and uh, I hope you tune in again soon.